Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Harper. I'm the Director of Workforce Research at ASTO. Uh, welcome to the PH Wins Accessing the Data webinar. Um, I'm going to be administering the webinar today. Um, I just wanted to announce to everyone, please uh, keep your phones on mute for our speakers. And also, this is quite a large group that we have today. So if you do have a question, please raise your hand. Or as the presenters are speaking, please enter your questions into the chat box, and we'll get to those at the end. So thank you so much for joining. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Katie Sellers. Thank you. Well, good, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining our webinar today. We are very excited to tell you about the Public Health Workforce Interest and Needs Survey, or PH WINS. Um, we were really glad to see there was a, a robust response to our invitation for this webinar. So um, don't want to take too much time introducing the topic. We really just want to go ahead and dive in and let you know more about Public Health Wins. Um, so our agenda for today is that we are going to have some comments from both Paul Jarris, Executive Director of ASTO, and Ed Hunter, who is the Chief Executive Officer for the de Beaumont Foundation. Um, and then after that, I will be going through the background of PH Wins, tell you a little bit about how we developed the survey, what the key findings were, some things you need to know about the data, and then how to access the data, and then we'll have time for questions and answers. So with that, what I'd like to do is go ahead and introduce Paul Jarris, the Executive Director of ASTO, um, so he can go ahead and make some comments about PH Wins. Thank you, Katie, and uh, welcome to the call, everyone. We really appreciate your taking the time to learn some more about public health wins. Um, we are very excited uh, about this survey. Um, as you know, ASTO represents the chief public health officials in the 50 states, D.C., and the U.S. territories and freely associated states, and um, our members oversee the agencies. We're about 100,000 people in public health uh, are working, uh, the state health agencies. And they feel a real responsibility to um, create an environment which is attractive to the best and brightest and retains them uh, as well as develops their career over time so they can continue to move uh, into leadership positions within public health. So in any case, the Beaumont and Astro began brainstorming about this concept of public health wins because we really didn't know enough about our workforce and the challenges they were facing or the environments in which they were working. So with uh, the de Beaumont, ASTO convened about 31 different organizations. Uh, these were both our affiliated organizations, sister organizations like NATO, and, and peer groups uh, such as environmental health directors, preparedness directors, and others within uh, human resource directors within the state health agencies. The convening um, took place, and during that time, the experts began uh, prioritizing what are the important and critical areas that we truly need to look at. The three things they came up with were systems thinking, communicating persuasively, and change management. And rather than proceed as is often done with asking leadership or, or management about uh, the uh, employees' views themselves, uh, this was an exciting attempt to actually, and Katie will tell more about the number of surveys that went out and the respondents, but it, was, it took quite a bit of time to work with the states and engage their cooperation get their mailing lists, and uh, um, survey the actual workers within public health agencies. There was good news and some challenges. Uh, workers were very highly satisfied. Uh, many or most saw, and Katie will give you the numbers later, but saw the, the, the how their work fit into the overall vision in public health, and, and they really came to work to give it their best every day. Um, we also found some challenges. About 38% um, still intend to leave the governmental public health workforce before 2020. So we anticipate a very large turnover. So what public health wins does is gives us an excellent sample of the workforce across the country, enables us to prioritize from their point of view what it is they need and how we can better improve the workforce, as well as um, what we need to do to align the public health workforce with some of the vision of the leadership um, across public health and of the health agencies. So with that, um, I again want to thank you, and I'd like to turn it over to uh, Ed Hunter, um, who's been a tremendous partner um, leading to Beaumont in this effort. 
thanks, Paul, and uh, thanks all of you for joining. I um, just want to note that at, at De Beaumont, our, real, our singular mission is focused on improving and strengthening the public health uh, practice in the U.S., and that really inevitably leads you to looking at the workforce and figuring what issues in training and retention and job satisfaction and, you know, uh, what can we do to anticipate the, the coming turnover and uh, and how how can we use um, this moment with data uh, in hand to really work on strengthening the public health workforce so I think it shows uh, the wind survey shows a lot of important needs uh, that we can in fact meet and it also serves as a call to action to uh, motivating us to to take some steps to do some improvements I want to point out to you that there's a supplement uh, to the um, JPHMP, the Journal of Public Health Management and Practice, that will be released online the first week of October, um, has articles from some uh, on this call, but um, 12 research articles as well as commentaries that really delve into uh, what the PH wins um, analysis up to this point have shown us, um, getting into some of the issues Paul mentioned about um, coming transition, but training and uh, skill gaps and um, job satisfaction and retention, just a, a lot of issues that I think are really important to us going forward. But this supplement really just scratches the surface of what we can learn from this data, both at the state level, um, at the national level, looking at subgroups, looking at training specific issues, um, cross state comparisons, a whole host of things that um, we've begun to look at and states are beginning to take advantage of the data that is available at that level of detail. Um, but the more we know and the more analyses that can come from this, the more we can move to address some of these underlying issues and in the process of doing that, um, learn um, of the uses of the data in ways that can inform a next iteration of WINS so, so that we can look at the uh, outcomes of changes that um, might be made across the U.S. So we really look forward to um, your work and creative uses uh, that the data can be put to. Um, and um, with that, I'm going to turn it back to uh, Katie to just start diving in. Great. Thank you so much, Ed. And, and, and again, thank you so much for the De Beaumont Foundation's partnership and support. This has truly been a collaborative project, and um, it, it's been a, a, a real pleasure to work with the Foundation on it. So. As I said, I'd like to get started by giving you all some background um, on the survey. Um, so a as Paul mentioned, we started out the, uh, thinking about this project by really pulling together quite a few stakeholders. We had 31 different organizations um, that we engaged and built consensus with around what the training needs of the workforce were. And um, as Paul mentioned, systems thinking, communicating persuasively, change management, those all came up as the top three. And then we also talked about informatics and analytics, working with diverse populations, and problem solving. These were all top needs that the leaders in different programs in state health departments, in local health departments, and across our partners, um, even at the federal level, were all in agreement that as far as cross-cutting training needs, these were really the top things that the workforce needed from the perspective of the leadership. So moving into phase two of the background, um, what we started to do was think, okay, well, we've, we've built this consensus from the leaders in the public health enterprise. What we need to do is field a survey that will really help us get the perspectives of the frontline workers, of everybody who works in these health departments learn from them what they think their needs are and learn from them what their perspectives are on what it's like to work in a health department um, and their thoughts about some of the national trends that folks who are working at the national level might take for granted as important, but folks working on the front lines in the state or local health departments may not have heard of, or if they've heard of it, they may not see it as important. So. What we wanted to do was put together a survey where we could really gather these individual level perspectives. And so we pulled together a technical expert panel. Um, and if you could just go back on the slides, what we worked with the technical expert panel on was how to sample the public health workforce, how to do this in a way that would be nationally representative. 
what exactly to put in the survey, what it ought to look like, what it ought to contain, how to keep it brief, et cetera, and then also how to administer the survey in the most effective and efficient manner. So then once we got that advice from the technical expert panel, and then in phase three, um, we really solidified what the goal of the survey was. And the goal of the survey is to collect perspectives from the field on workforce issues, to validate responses from leaders on workforce development priorities, and to collect data to monitor over time. And to really lay out concretely what the three aims were. The first one was to inform future workforce development investments. The second one is to establish a baseline of key workforce development metrics. And the third is to explore workforce attitudes, morale, and climate. So in developing the survey and figuring out how we were going to administer it, we made a decision that we would have three separate sampling frames. So one would be state health agencies, um, and specifically we were looking at employees in the central office of state health agencies. Then we also wanted to work with the local health departments that are part of the Big City Health Coalition. And then finally, we wanted to do a local pilot just to look at what it would look like to field this survey in local health departments throughout a state. And so we worked with uh, six states in the local pilot and um, contacted employees in those local health departments. When we developed the survey instrument itself, one of the key features was to make it brief, so we kept it at 15 minutes, which meant cutting out a lot of questions that we had thought would be interesting to include. Um, the areas of interest really included training needs of the workforce, uh, the workforce environment and job satisfaction, perception of national trends, and demographics. Another key feature of the survey was that we really wanted to utilize previously tested survey items and questions wherever it was possible to do so. So you'll see on this slide a list of different um, surveys that we used within a, the PHWIN survey. Um, and I want to just take a moment to point out the last one here in case you're not familiar with it. It's the University of Michigan Public Health Workforce Schema. This is something you may also ha have heard of as um, either the CDC or the University of Michigan Workforce Taxonomy. Um, it was actually published in the American Journal of Preventive Medicine. Um, it was a CDC and HRSA funded effort to put together a, a, a systematic way to characterize different dimensions of um, data on the workforce. So, where are people working? Who are they working for? What are they doing in their jobs? What is their position? What is their academic background, et cetera? It was a way to really comprehensively um, identify different options systematically, but it was just a taxonomy. It was not an actual um, questionnaire. And so PH Wins was the first time anyone used the taxonomy in an actual survey, particularly in a large scale like this. Um, and so that was really helpful for, for us to do that with the taxonomy. Um, finally, once we developed the survey, we did cognitive interviewing and some uh, pre-testing to make sure that the survey would work properly. So we fielded the survey online um, September through December of 2014. For the states, our sampling frame came from staff lists. We asked each of the state health departments who agreed to participate to provide a list of all of the state health agency staff working in the central office. So this was all different kinds of staff, whether they were either public health science oriented or maybe more administrative. Um, we wanted all of their employees working in the central office. And then for the local health departments, some of them were able to provide staff lists and some of them were um, only able to field the survey themselves to send it out to their email list themselves. We gave states the option to participate at a level that would allow them to, um, to contribute to the national representativeness of the survey or to be representative at the state level or if they wanted a more robust sample, <clears throat> actually not a sample, they could do it as a census. And 20 four of the 37 participating states decided on this census approach. 
When we sent out the survey invitations, there were approximately 53,000 that went out. Just about half of those, just under half, 25,000, went to central office employees. We did sampling without replacement. We promoted the survey via workforce champions. And the workforce champions were someone in each health department who had been designated as the point of contact to promote the survey, <coughs> excuse me, encourage people to um, fill it out and to, to make sure they knew that they were authorized to do that, they were allowed to do that, and that their agency supported the survey. Once we collected the data, we weighted it to account for complex sampling design and non-response. So the topics we covered, as I said, <coughs> were um, training needs, and, and some of the key training needs that we covered were those top three systems thinking communicating persuasively, and change management from the consensus building process that we went through. We covered about eight national trends, but just to give you a sense of what kinds of things we're talking about here, things like quality improvement, health information technology, and the Affordable Care Act. We also looked at some workplace environment issues, things like culture of learning, job satisfaction, and the extent to which workers felt empowered to make decisions. And then we also looked into some aspects of demographics. So the survey was closed in December. We wound up with over 23,000 responses. We actually had more responses than we expected from local health departments. And part of the reason for this was that when we asked the states to submit their staff lists, we, we asked that it include those who were housed um, at the central office of the state health agency. But then when the surveys went out, a lot of people responded that they were actually working in a local office. They had been assigned to a local office. So, um, that's why there were more than we expected from the local health departments. And ultimately, our overall response rate was about 45%. So I'm going to give you some details on the results that we received as far as training needs go. Um, I'm not including all of the training needs here because we asked about quite a few. What I want to do is just kind of introduce you to the slide by showing you that the, the orange bars that you see, the longer bars, those are the folks, that's the proportion of the respondents who said that this item was either somewhat or very important to their day-to-day -day work. So they weren't talking about whether or not this is important to the agency as a whole, but to their specific job. And then the blue bar shows of those who said it was somewhat or very important to their current work, the blue bar represents those who said they were either unable to perform this task or they were really a beginner at doing it. So those are the people who said that they had kind of a low, low level of skill in that area. So we interpret these blue bars to be the proportion of people in the state health agency who are really open to, receptive to, know that they need training in this particular area. So not only is it important to their job, but they don't think they do a good job of doing it. So with influencing policy development, you can see that 72% of the respondents thought that it was important to their everyday work and 35% of those felt that their skill level was really not very high. So lots were interested in training on how to influence policy development. This next item, understanding the relationship between a new policy and many types of public health problems, 76% said that they thought that was important to their everyday work, and 30% of those felt that their, their own skill level was not very high. When you look at preparing a program budget with justification, you see that 62% thought that was important to their day-to-day -day work. It's not surprising that that's lower than the others because remember, we, we surveyed all levels of workers in this. So you're getting administrative assistants and um, you know, janitors as well as program managers and executives here. Um, so it's not surprising that a lower level of folks thought that it was important to their job, but 62% is really quite high. And of course, 27% of those felt that their skill level was not very high. This next item, assessing the broad array of factors that influence specific public health problems, that's kind of a social determinants item. And what we saw here was that a, a fairly high percentage of people, 71%, felt that this was important to their everyday work. And just over a quarter of them felt that their, um, their skills were really not very high in this area. So as you can also see, 
Quite a few people thought that collaborating with diverse communities to identify and solve health problems was important. Finding evidence on public health efforts that work was important. Ensuring that programs are managed within the current and forecasted budget constraints was important. Anticipating the changes in your environment, physical, political, environmental, that may influence your work. That's, of course, an item that was intended to get at the change management issues that were said to be important in our consensus building process. And you can see 84% of respondents felt that that was important. They can see the importance of the change management right now. And less than a quarter of them, about 22%, felt that they needed some training in that area. Finally, addressing the needs of diverse populations in a culturally sensitive way. Again, that was 77% who recognized that that was important to their jobs, and 22% are looking for training in that area. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the national trends. As I said, there were eight different things that we looked at. Um, when you look at this slide, what you see with the blue bars is the percentage of respondents who said that they had heard of this trend. We then, if, if they had heard of the trend, then we asked some follow-up questions about it. So if they had heard of the trend, then we would ask them if it was, uh, how important it was to public health in general. So this is different from the previous one where we asked about how important it was to their everyday job. So we were asking how important it was um, to public health in general, and the red line represents those who thought it was somewhat or very important. The green bar represents those who thought it would impact their day-to-day -day work a fair amount or a great amount. And then the purple bar represents those who felt that even more emphasis should be placed on this trend than is already being placed on it. So when you look at this, you see for the implementation of the Affordable Care Act, almost everyone has heard of that. That's at 92%. 85% think that it's somewhat or very important to public health. Only 43% thought that it would impact their day-to-day -day work a fair amount, and only 40% thought that there should be more emphasis on that. So that says to me, recognition of this is pretty high. Um, every, you know, almost everyone's heard of it, and people are saying, you know, less than half of people think there needs to be more emphasis on it. So, so there's there's a feeling that um, they, they've seen enough emphasis on it. With health and all policies, you see a very different situation. So only 52% of the respondents had heard of health and all policies. Of those who had heard it, of it, 86% thought that it was somewhat or very important to public health. Only 46% thought it would impact their day-to-day -day work. And only 41% thought that more emphasis should be placed on this trend. So it's interesting to see here, they're not necessarily calling for more emphasis on it, but those 48% who haven't even heard of it might warrant that additional emphasis on health and all policies until it's recognized more broadly. On evidence-based public health practice, 75% had heard of it, 93% thought it was very important or somewhat important, um, which is a very high number, 59% thought it would impact their day-to-day -day work, and 48%, which is closer to half, were thinking there should be more emphasis placed on it. With public health and primary care integration, again, about three-quarters have heard of it. The vast majority who have heard of it think it's very important. Uh, right around half think it'll impact their day-to-day -day work, and over half think that more emphasis should be placed on that trend in the future. The other four trends we asked about were public health systems and services research, leveraging electronic health information, fostering a culture of quality improvement, and cross-jurisdictional sharing of public health services. With the PHSSR, <coughs> Systems and Services Research, again, you see a very low level of familiarity. Really only just over half had heard of it. Those who had heard of it thought it was important, but of course not as quite as high a level as the other items that we asked about. 40% thought it would impact their day-to-day -day work a fair or great amount, and only 33% thought that more emphasis should be placed on this trend in the future. So that had some, some lower numbers than the other ones. Leveraging electronic health information, recognized by 81%, 93% think it's important. And then here's where the numbers are higher here than in, in most of the other items, that 58% 
say it will impact their day-to-day -day work, and 57% believe that more emphasis should be placed on this trend. That's the highest of all the items in terms of thinking more emphasis should be placed on it. With fostering a quality of culture, uh, sorry, fostering a culture of quality improvement, 83% thought it was, 83% uh, had heard of it, um, and 96% of those thought that it was somewhat or very important to public health. That's the highest one of those numbers, I believe. 70% thought it would impact their day-to-day -day work, and again, over half thought that more emphasis should be placed on this trend. So people are really open to learning more about quality improvement and recognize how important it is to their work. Finally, with cross-jurisdictional sharing of public health services, 72% recognized it, 90% thought it was important, just around half think it will impact their day-to-day -day work, and 47% thought more emphasis should be placed on it in the future. So next I'm going to go over the workplace environment results. Um, this first slide is on the culture of learning, and I just want to clarify that this was uh, a question that was done on a five-point Likert scale. So we were asking if the health department does these things, and the respondent was to indicate whether they um, agreed or it was a scale from strongly disagree to strongly agree, a five-point scale. And so um, having, having a staff position responsible for internal training, 62 percent said that they had that. Eighty percent uh, said that, that their health department provided on-site training. Seventy-seven percent said the health department would pay travel or registration fees for trainings. Ninety-two percent, almost all, responded that um, they were allowed to use working hours to participate in training. Fifty-nine percent say that education and training objectives are included in their performance reviews. And 30 percent said that, that continuing education is required. For job satisfaction, as you can see, this is on a five-point Likert scale. Um, about being satisfied with their job or their organization or their pay. So with uh, job satisfaction, what, what I think is key about this slide is if you add the somewhat satisfied and the very satisfied together, what you see for those who are satisfied with their job, it's 79% are somewhat or very satisfied with their job. For the organization, if you add somewhat and very together, you see that 65% are somewhat or are very satisfied with their organization, so lower than the job satisfaction. And then finally, when you look at pay, of course, that's the lowest, and that's about 48% are somewhat or very satisfied with their pay. So finally, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the demographics <coughs> of the um, public health workforce. Um, here you see the distribution by gender. We already knew that this was um, a field with more females than males, but it came out as 72 to 28 percent, which validates some research we've seen in the past as well. Um, when you look at supervisory status, the way we um, defined these were that non-supervisors, of course, were not supervising any other employees. Team leaders provide employees with day-to-day -day guidance on work projects, but they don't have official supervisory responsibility. Supervisors obviously do have that supervisor responsibility, um, but the workers in this category don't supervise other supervisors, so they're not that high up in the hierarchy. And then the managers supervise one or more supervisors, and then the executives were defined as those who are a member of the senior executive service. As far as race and ethnicity goes, um, this distribution is somewhat similar to what you see in the U.S. population in general in terms of black or African American, um, but 17 percent of the U.S. population is Hispanic or Latino, um, and about 62 percent is white. So if you look at the numbers here, clearly the Hispanic and Latino population is underrepresented in the public health workforce. And this was true when we broke it down by the paired regions as well. Um, all of them showed an underrepresentation of the Hispanic and Latino population. We also looked at the workforce by what type of position they held. And so we had 28% in some kind of administrative position, 14% in a clinical or lab position, 41% in the traditional public health sciences, 
and then 16% were in social services and, and all other categories. This shows you the age distribution, and I think what is most striking about this slide is how heavy it skews down towards the 56 to 60 and the um, 51 to 55. So about 48% of the workforce is over 50 years of age. Um, this gives you a sense of where the salaries lie. They tend to um, have the, the largest part of the curve there right around 45,000 to 65,000 or so. And then here we looked at educational attainment. Um, we found that 18% of the workforce had associate's degrees, 75% had bachelor's degrees, 38% had a master's of some sort, and 9% had a doctoral degree of some sort. Um, we also looked at professional certifications and found that about a third had a professional certification. And then we asked um, specifically if their degree had a public health focus. So this could be a, a bachelor's in public health, a master's in public health, or a doctorate in public health. And that came to about 17%. So only 17% of the workforce has a, a formal public health degree. So about the data, um, we do have a code book and a methodology report available on the website. Um, we will be releasing the data on a regional level, and when we say that, it's actually paired regions. So we went by the same um, regions as the Department of Health and Human Services, but we paired them up so that um, we could get a bigger sample and be representative at that paired regional level. Um, state identifiers, qualitative data, and access to the local data requires special permission, um, a detailed proposal, and justification. So we really are protecting the confidentiality of the respondents on this, particularly with that qualitative data or with the state identifiers, um, because people, you know, we ask a lot of questions about people's jobs, and um, for obvious reasons, they had some concerns about confidentiality, and we assured them that we would not um, release their comments and that, that their, what, what they said in the survey would never be able to get back to, um, to their bosses. Um, so the state identifiers can only be used for statistical purposes. Um, we're not doing state-to-state -state comparisons. That's not going to be allowed. Um, but we can do regional comparisons. Um, and there's going to be a methods webinar that will be available on YouTube very soon. So how to access the data? Um, basically, the data are, are available for you to request at this link here. Um, your steps to accessing the data are to visit that website, to complete the little survey that's in there, which is a way for you to submit a brief proposal or abstract. We're not asking for a 20-page document. We just need to know what you're planning to do with the data. Um, we can take a look at it, see whether it's possible to do with the data, maybe give you some feedback about it, but just make sure that what you're doing is a legitimate research project. That's really what we're looking at. Um, so we'll review the pro proposal, and then um, if it's successful, we'll sign a data use agreement. You'll need to sign a data use agreement, and um, then we'll share the data via a secure SharePoint site. And I think that's it. At this point, we'd like to open it up for questions. Thanks, Katie. Um, so people on um, the line, please either raise your hand if you have a question. There's that chat box feature, so please type in your questions. Um, or if, if you have one, I think there are a few enough people on um, the phone that we should be able to just field, field questions as they come. So please uh, feel free to ask questions now. So while people might be um, thinking or contemplating their questions, one announcement we can make is that um, the researchers on this project uh, did work um, very hard to create uh, 
a special supplement that's going to be available in the Journal of Public Health Management and Practice. So for those of you on the phone who are just interested in learning more about pH wins and, and the project, um, an entire supplement will be devoted to um, the findings and, and the results of, of this project. So that should be available uh, by mid-October, again, in the Journal of Public Health Management and Practice. Are there any are there any questions on the line um, or on the phone? We can any any of the speakers can can respond to questions. Hey Elizabeth, this is Jessica Pittman from CSTE. Um, I guess my Hi. question is is do we know if um, this assessment and how the results are being disseminated? Is it starting conversations at state health departments about what they want to focus on for improvement? That's a great question. Um, Katie, do you want to take that one? Yeah, I'd be happy to take that, Jessica. That's an excellent question. Um, I would say absolutely the answer is yes. Um, we have heard from a number of states that they're really looking at the results, looking at um, what they need to improve upon. We produced state-level reports that we shared with the state health agencies, and we tried to make a real point to make it clear um, you know, there's a lot of data in here, and we tried to make it clear, you know, here are some key points for you to look at and some things for you to think about trying to improve because your numbers look lower than, um, than in your peer states. Um, of course, it's up to them what they choose to, to try to improve upon. So um, they're doing some of that work already. We are also working on a proposal we would very much like to help the states in driving that kind of improvement. And so um, we're, we're hoping to partner with the De Belmont Foundation to, to do that in a more structured way with a number of states to really help them um, target those areas for improvement and track progress over time. Great. Thank you. So we have, we have a question um, in the chat box feature, and that is, uh, will ASTO be taking over from NACHO in these public health workforce assessments? Will we look to ASTO for this workforce data rather than the NATO profiles? Uh, Katie, do you mind taking that one too? Um, I'm not 100% sure to answer how to answer that. I would say we are certainly not taking over anything from the NATO profile. We do an ASTO profile. NATO does a NATO profile. We very much work together on those. So that kind of data that's collected at the agency level will continue to be collected at the agency level in those profile surveys. This is much more at the individual level. Um, and we do work with NACHO on this project. We are um, intending to work with them more on it in the future. So I would not say we're taking over anything that um, NACHO had been doing, but I would say that if you're looking for data that is gathered at the individual level, so you have workers telling you about their own training needs as opposed to leaders in the health department telling you what they think the training needs of their workers are. Um, if you want that individual level data, this would be the place to go for it. I do want to just clarify that when I juxtapose those two, that, that um, data from leaders on what they think the training needs are, versus data from individuals on what they think their own training needs are. I'm not actually saying that one is better than the other. I think they're complementary. I think that um, it's really good to get that data from the individuals, but people don't always know what they don't know. And so it's also very good to get that data from the leaders who can see what their employees are and are not doing, what they are and are not able to do, um, and give an assessment of their needs. So I think those two pieces really complement each other. Does that answer the question? He says, great answer. So thanks, Katie. Great, thanks. Um, so we have another question, and that is, how are the regions defined? And um, I can take that. And JP, please feel free to, to weigh in if I miss something. But basically what we did is we took the uh, Health and Human Services resource map of the 10 regions, and we just 
paired those up. So we have five regions in our data set. And if you would like a map of what that looks like or um, how that is in, in the data set, you can shoot me an email and I can, I can let you know exactly what they are. Um, but I forget exactly off the top of my head how, how they were paired. Um, I don't know if JP, you have anything to add to that. Um, yeah, so <clears throat> these were contiguous regions. We paired HHS regions 1 and 3, 2 and 4, and then I believe the remaining are just you know, 5, 6, and 7, 8, 9, 10. But we can provide a map or the exact states that go into the region will be available in the documentation along with the data set. Yeah, actually I'm pretty sure it's 1 and 2, 3 and 5, 4 and 6, you know what, 7 that sounds and 8, right. I 9 question. and 10. Yeah. I hope that answers your question. Great. Um, okay, are there any other are there any other questions? We can wait a couple more minutes for them uh, to come in. I don't see any other hands raised as well, but please if you have a question, feel free to shout it out. What are the biggest implications for this study in terms of um, priorities, priorities, next steps? I think the biggest implications are, first of all, a really big proportion of the current workforce is planning to leave. 38% is planning to leave in the next year. Um, sorry, in the next five years. So that um, that means any health department that is not knee-deep in succession planning um, needs to become so. <laughs> um, I think some other top findings are that people have not heard about health in all policies. I think that's an important thing that um, some education needs to be circulated about. Um, also that workers really want training on policy development, on um, systems thinking uh, that um, another another important finding um, is that they don't see creativity and innovation being rewarded in health departments. So I think all of these are very actionable items. Um, you know, health departments can really start looking at what are the best practices for fostering innovation in government. It's not something in a, that government is, is known to be good at, um, but it is something they can work towards. And, um, you know, when you look at that workforce that's not as diverse as it ought to be and is aging as much as it is, what they, what they need to focus on is creating an environment where um, people of color, people who are Hispanic and Latino, um, people who are younger will feel included and will feel challenged and happy. Um, and creating an environment where creativity and innovation are rewarded instead of just doing things the same old way um, might be much more attractive to the, to the younger folks coming into government. So I think those are some of the, the top takeaways for, for health departments to think about how to transform the environment to, to make it the kind of place where these people want to work. And Katie, if I can add to that, this is Ed Hunter. One of the striking things is how committed the workforce is to the mission of public health. And I don't know that you would find that in every department of states or cities, but I think that was a striking finding. It's in the high 70s, 80 percent range that a primary motivation for people to be working in these agencies, despite the fact that they're not all, uh, you know, highly degreed in public health or out of public health um, schools is that they're drawn to the mission. So that yet despite that, there's a huge projected turnover, there's frustration with um, you know, with the the ability to innovate and be creative. So I think there's simultaneously in the survey you can see the building blocks of how we can recruit people to public health, how we can retain them, how we can improve on job satisfaction and also, you know, the blunt um, here's some of the things that frustrate the workforce and might be leading to some of that um, that turnover. So you've got you've got some real things to chew on and work with there. 
Thank you. I have another online question. Um, it, it is, in Kansas, educational attainment is critical as we are lagging behind national averages. How can a local health department incentivize education or attract educated individuals with funding constraints? And he acknowledges that this might be an impossible question. <laughs> Uh, you know, that's hard to do. Um, I really believe that the health department academic partnerships are the way to go on this. Um, it definitely looks like those kind of partnerships where you have interns coming through the office learning what state public health is all about and forming those network ties. And also that gives the health department an opportunity to see you know, to, to kind of try a student out um, and then try to actively recruit that student after they graduate. Um, I mean, that's, that's one solution. I know it's difficult when you, when you can't offer a competitive salary, um, but that is, that is one way to try to attract students. Get them in there working on that mission and, and excited about that mission, and maybe they'll come back even though it's a little bit less money. So, JP, did you want to add a comment? Yeah, so a lot, of, a lot of the issues that we're seeing play out at the states and local level also has to do with certain federal policies. And HRSA, for instance, is starting to re-examine, though I don't think they've made any final decisions, Ed, correct me if you've heard something different, about uh, greater eligibility for loan forgiveness for public health practitioners as, uh, in serving in underserved areas. Thanks for sharing that, JP. Um, okay, do we have do we have any other final thoughts, um, questions, anything anything to discuss with the speakers today? If there's nothing coming from the audience. Um, I guess I would just like to add again how excited I am that you all are interested in this. I think once you dive into the data, you will find that it's absolutely fascinating. And there are a zillion papers that could be written from this data. And um, I, hope, I hope you will find the same thing when you look at it and get excited about doing some new analysis that no one has done yet. I think there's a lot of great opportunities in here. Yeah, thanks for that, Katie. And just also thank you to everyone on the line. Your organizations helped us promote this webinar. Um, it is being recorded, so if any of your colleagues or students or partners would be interested in finding out about individual uh, public health perspectives, um, we are going to convert this webinar into a YouTube video, and we will share it on our website at asco.org slash phwins. Thank you. Okay, well it doesn't, it doesn't look like we have any other questions. I think we're going to go ahead and wrap up the call a little bit early. So thank you again for everyone um, that joined. Uh, a special thank you to Paul Jarrett and Ed Hunter that were able to introduce um, the topic. And I hope that everyone has uh, a good rest of their week. Thanks, Elizabeth. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.